All right, so we've got some gases notes to do, and this is just a basic introduction to the kinetic molecular theory at the sophomore and high school level. We do not get into real big details or explanations about why or anything at this level, um, but it does give you a good introduction of the five points of the kinetic molecular theory as they do apply to gases. So, kinetic molecular theory, which from here on out will pretty much always be abbreviated with a KM is based on the idea that particles are always constantly moving. And the word kinetic means movement. Molecular, of course, refers to molecules. And so this is moving molecules. This is the theory of moving molecules. Um, it can be applied to a solid, liquid, or gas because, of course, those things are always in motion. Now, as you go from one state to the next, the, the motion does increase with gas being the highest kinetic energy of the three states. Um, but none of these guys are the molecules completely still. Um, what the kinetic molecular theory allows us to do with gases is it provides us with a model. And a model is a representation of something in, its, in, in a perfect world. And so it's a model of an ideal gas behavior. And as you guys are probably learning in your own chemistry classes, um, or if you're one of my children in my chemistry class, things don't always work as you expect them to. And so because this is a model of an ideal gas behavior, it's only an approximation of what a real gas is going to do in the real world. And so when the KMT is applied to gases, there are five assumptions. And if a gas adheres to all five assumptions, then it is an ideal gas. And as we go through each of the five assumptions, I'm gonna tell you how a gas can deviate from that assumption and cause that particular gas to be less ideal ideal. So first of all, gases consist of tiny particles that are really far apart. The majority of the volume of a gas is just empty space. Um, and the, almost all gases do uh, um, adhere to this uh, first assumption. Gases do have very low density. No matter what the compound is, the lowest density state for that compound or that element is going to be the gas phase. Um, and this is why gases can be squished. You can take a balloon and you can squish it. You can take a syringe and you can fill it full of air and then plug it up to where it's sealed off and you can push the plunger in because there is all of this empty space in here and you can force, I know you can't see my lines, um, you can force the gas particles to be closer together. The second assumption is that all collisions between particles and container walls are elastic. Now what does this word mean? Basically what it means is that there is no net loss of energy when those particles collide. So the particles hit each other with a certain amount of energy and when they bounce off of each other they are still traveling with that same amount of energy. Basically that the total kinetic energy of any sample of a gas always stays constant. Well, if you've ever dropped a ball on the ground, you know that perfectly elastic collisions don't happen. You are going to lose some energy to, you know, whatever cause, you know, maybe it's sound, maybe it's heat, you know, whatever that energy of, of motion is going to be converted into another kind of energy. And so in the real world, the collisions are not perfectly elastic. But the nice thing about gases is that they are moving so fast that they're pretty close to being elastic. The third assumption is that particles are in continuous, rapid, random motion. They're just literally bouncing all over the place. Um, <clears throat> see, I want to get all this up. Oh, you kind of, it's kind of hard to see this. Um, but so they're moving, they have kinetic energy, and it's the kinetic energy that causes them to overcome their attractive forces, which will actually lead us into the fourth assumption. But all these little gas particles, they're just going, and they do always travel in straight lines. You're not going to have a gas particle just randomly curve. Now, again, this is in an ideal gas. You actually can have that kind of interaction between a real gas if it is highly polar, like water vapor is very, very polar. It actually um, experiences hydrogen bonding when in the liquid and solid state. And in the gaseous state, the molecule, the H2O molecule is so polar that it'll attract itself. Like, okay, you know, you got water, looks like this. Lewis structure here for water. And this end just has a little bit of a negative 
charge and this end has a little bit of a positive charge. Well, this negative end will attract the positive end of another hydrogen molecule, uh, I mean, uh, the hydrogen end of a water molecule, and it will actually cause, you know, let's say you got a little water molecule here and a little water molecule there, and they're traveling, you know, kind of at each other where eventually they'd probably hit and bounce off. Well, as they get closer to each other, they're kind of like magnets. They'll actually start drawing each other in until you do get your collision and then they, you know, go bouncing off in their respective directions. Now, I've overdrawn this. I mean, this is an over-exaggerated drawing. This doesn't actually happen this extremely, but it does happen. Uh, and that actually does lead us to the fourth assumption, and that is a horrible picture. I apologize for that. I didn't realize that was going to show up this bad. But that there are no forces of attraction or repulsion. And in the majority of gases, that's true. They're traveling so fast and they're so spread out that the gas, the individual gas particles don't have time to notice each other. And the warmer a gas is, the more likely they are to be traveling fast enough to not notice each other. If you start to cool a gas down, and especially if you get close to the condensation point, the particles won't be traveling fast enough, and they will take notice of each other, and you'll start to, you know, form things up. Uh, and I kind of like to think of this whole entire, all parts of this theory as just like, you know, shoot and pull. Whenever you shoot the cue ball into a pool ball, they don't stick together, they bounce apart. And the, the energy of the cue ball gets transferred into the energy of the pool ball. And so you kind of have an elastic collision, but it's not like a perfectly elastic collision, because eventually, of course, the ball does slow down and stop. <clears throat> and so in an ideal gas, they're not attracted to each other. In a real gas, you're going to experience at least a little attraction or repulsion. Um, and then the final theory, or the final assumption of the kinetic molecular theory is that the average kinetic energy depends on temperature. And this is true. Kinetic energy increases as temperature increases. And there's a lovely little formula that goes with this that states that kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared, and we will actually deal with a, a version of this formula when we talk about Graham's Law of Effusion later. So like I said, m is the mass, v is the velocity. So basically, if you have two samples of gas, they're at the same temperature. <clears throat> that means the same temperature, the kinetic energy is going to be the same. If you have a particle that is lighter, it has to travel faster to make up that same kinetic energy. I'm going to give you a very, very simplified math example of this. Let's say that the kinetic energy being experienced by two samples of gas. So we got a sample of gas here. I know that this doesn't look very homogeneous, but it is. And then we have, this is sample gas one. And then we have another sample of a gas, sample gas two. We'll call him a little bit heavier gas. So we got two samples of gas here. They're both at the same temperature and thus have the same kinetic energy. <clears throat> well, what this says is that in order for these guys to have the same kinetic energy, let's just say, like I said, I'm picking easy numbers here. Let's say the kinetic energy is, no, let's go with 10. Nice round number. Monk would be proud of this number. Um, so the kinetic energy is 10. And these would have units on it, of course, but we're just going with this. Um, so if gas 1, let's say gas 1 had a mass of 1. And gas 2 had a mass of 2. Well, how are their velocities going to compare? So you would say, okay, kinetic energy equals mass, which is 1, times velocity squared divided by 2. Same thing over here. Same kinetic energy because they're at the same temperature is equal to 2, the mass, times the velocity squared divided by 2. Well, this ends up being uh, 10 equals 0.5 velocity squared. So velocity squared equals 20. I just divided both sides by 0.5. And velocity is going to equal, I actually have to plug this in. I know it's for something, but I can't think of what exactly it is. 4.47, that was pretty sad of me.
and then of course the units would go there. For here, the twos are gonna cancel out and we just end up with v squared equals 10 and the square root of 10 is 3.16, I should have known that. So you can see that the lighter gas, gas number one in this case, has to have a faster velocity in order to have the same kinetic energy as our heavier gas. And whenever we start talking about different gases and how quickly they would um, diffuse through a room, the lighter gases will diffuse faster than heavier gases because they have to travel faster in order to be at the same temperature. All right, so what's the difference between ideal and real gases? Well, first of all, ideal gases are defined exactly according to the kinetic molecular theory, whereas a real gas might not be obeying one or two or maybe all of the assumptions of the KMT. So what can you do to get a gas to uh, behave itself? Well, if you get a gas really good and hot, the hotter it is, the faster it travels, and the faster it travels, the more likely its collisions are to be elastic and there's not gonna be any forces between the gas particles. And that's what I talked about right there. And if you relieve the pressure, and this gives them, according to, to the assumption number one, lots of space between the gas particles, because you know, gases expand, fill their container. So if you give it a really large space to spread out in, then again, they're gonna have lots of space between the gas particles and they're not gonna see each other enough to have any kind of an attractive or repulsive forces. So, high temperature, low pressure. You need to remember these two situations because this is what will cause a gas to behave more ideal. And I can't remember if I put it on the next one, there we go. Um, and then gases with little attraction, and I'm gonna add in to each other. So a long time ago, we talked about Lewis structures and how to recognize if a compound was polar or nonpolar. Well, nonpolar compounds have little attraction. So if you have monatomic gases, these would be your noble gases, um, or if you had nonpolar, like um, the Brinkelhoffs, any of those that are gases, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, those are all diatomic and they are all nonpolar. Um, some of the, the bigger organic molecules, CO2 is a nonpolar molecule, and so it doesn't have much attraction. The problem with CO2 is, is that it's a really heavy gas, and that's why it doesn't behave very ideal. Um, but gases that are polar have really high attraction, and so they're not going to behave as ideal, like I was talking about with the water earlier. And now pressure is, this is just a great formula here that you may or may not need. You won't really need it for my class much, but showing you the difference between um, pressure and then just regular old force. You can experience a lot of pressure if you take a tiny force and put it over a tiny area. Um, I like to have my students take their hand, spread it out with their fingers all, you know, here's your hand and your fingers are going like this. And you spread your fingers out like that. I know it's great hand, isn't it? And you press on your leg as hard as you can. And you'll notice that it, it probably doesn't hurt. Maybe if you have a sore wrist, it hurts a little bit. And then you do the same thing, except you use your pointer finger. And you, again, press as hard as you can using the same muscles as you did on the first one. You'll notice that it actually hurts. And what we did, we kept the force the same. You're using the same arm, the same strength, but we decreased the area. And if you decrease the area, if the area goes down, then the pressure goes up. So what do I want you to know about pressure? Well, I want you to know that as the surface area goes down, the pressure goes up, and that pressure is influenced by all three of these things, and we'll talk about these things a lot more in the future. Like there, I think it's probably four or five videos on here just relating these four variables to each other in some way. That's where all the scientists' laws came from. Charles and Boyles and Gay Lussacs and, and Avogadro's uh, law and all those. Um, measuring pressure, you typically use a barometer. I'm not really going to talk a lot about this. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in your book on page 310. Or if you're not one of my children, then just Google search barometer and you can learn all about it. You can also use a manometer, which no, is not a measurement of your manliness. Um, it is a measurement of the pressure of a gas in a particular container, in a closed container. So those little dials that are on the helium tanks, that's a manometer. 
and there's a picture, a very, very rudimentary picture of one. The way that you would calculate the pressure of this gas is to take this height and subtract it from that height. And this is where this next set of notes will pick up, uh, just specifically dealing with units of pressure and their conversions. So if you guys have any questions, you know how to find me.